sneeze, I'm Animal Kingdom. This is Seeker. Listen up. We've got to get in, grab the Iguanodon, and get out before that asteroid hits. <laughs> Riders in the front row can use their lever to tilt forward or backward. Riders in the back row can use their lever to fly higher or lower. Jellymon offspring. Hi, offspring. Jellymon. Jelly. Ugh. Totally. <laughs> well, what are you waiting for? W. -W Radio. You're in And welcome to the WDW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I am your host, Lou Mangiello, and this is show number 415 for the week of August 9th, 2015. I'm here to help you have the best possible Disney vacation experience and bring you a little bit of Disney magic wherever you are with this podcast, videos, blog, live broadcasts every Wednesday, special events, books, tours, and more. Whether you've been to the park hundreds of times or you're planning your first vacation, there's something here for you. You can find everything over at www.radio.com and subscribe to the podcast in iTunes. So as Disney prepares to induct a new class of Disney legends during the upcoming D23 Expo, this week I'm going to begin a new series where we focus on the life, legacy, and talents of some of those legends who've contributed to the films, parks, and overall magic of Disney. And this week, we're going to begin the series as we look at one of Walt's favorite artists, Mary Blair, whose amazing use of color and design contributed to films like Cinderella, Peter Pan, Alice in Wonderland, the It's a Small World attraction, and much more. I'll then have the answer to our last Walt Disney World trivia question of the week and pose a new, different challenge for your chance to win a Disney prize package then stay tuned to the end of the show for some updates and announcements, including information about upcoming Meet of the Month and On the Road events. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WDW Radio Show. As Disney is about to honor a new group of Disney legends at the upcoming D23 Expo in Anaheim, California, I thought it would be a good time to start a new series about some of the Disney legends on the show. And as you know, the Legends program was established back in 1987 and really recognizes and honors the people who have made not just integral, but really sort of extraordinary contributions to the company, the parks, the film, animation, TV, whatever it may be, and it has been awarded in a, in a special ceremony every year, and since 2009, they've been doing it biannually as part of the D23 Expo, and this for this segment, I wanted to start with someone whose name you probably know and probably have heard of, but might just not know how groundbreaking this person was in the movies and in the parks and in many, many other ways. And so that's why this week we're going to talk about 10 things you never knew about Mary Blair. And joining me is somebody else who you, whose name you probably know, but there's always something new to learn. He is an enigma wrapped in a conundrum, wrapped in a riddle. He is, of course, Ryan P. Wilson Matua of Main Street Gazette fame. Welcome, my friend. Thank you, and it's uh, it's also wrapped in an egg roll somewhere. <laughs> Very best egg rolls in Walt Disney World. Look, I took two, not even two minutes to get that food. thirty seconds. Is that what we did this time? I'm like, God, it's Mary Blair. How am I possibly going to wrap food into it? And look what you did there. I, I know how to do it. Uh, yeah, um, let's go with local foods. No, Walt Disney World. Yeah, I said local foods. Local, not the port. Local foods. Local foods. Local foods. Quick service next to Yak and Yeti. Oh, oh, I'm like, I was like, is it because I wasn't sure of like local foods. I'm like, you mean Whole Foods? It's, it's, oh, yeah. It's like lo local foods cafe. Why can't you just food. say Yak and Yeti quick service and be done with it? <laughs> Either way, it's a mouthful. I mean, really, at that point. I do love me some quick service at Yak and Yeti. Anyway, so we were we were talking about this idea of really wanting to start to honor some of the Disney legends and you know, I've had some on the show, some of whom are living Disney legends, but I think it's really important because you and I like talking about 
the, the history and honoring some of these people whose legacy is so important to what we get to see and experience in the parks. And I, and I think Mary Blair is a really, really good place to start because there are so many things that she's done. You know, people hear Mary Blair and they think, oh, she did, you know, didn't she do this or did, but, and that's why I want to sort of frame it in terms of 10 things you may have not known about Mary Blair because her history is so interesting and the things that she done, has done probably span beyond maybe some of the things that come to mind for people who are listening. And it definitely does. You know, there, she has this great history within and without of, of Disney and there's so much there, but it isn't anything that people are familiar with. They do know certain pieces of it. And so it's kind of taking the picture that they have and just going up on a grand scale and giving them the big picture view and you know truly paying respect to somebody that everyone knows but doesn't know everything about. Yeah, so some of these I think we'll, we'll have some fun with. Some of them I, I think will hopefully uh, make you more aware of her involvement in some of the things that you see or can look for or maybe some of the things you already are enjoying. So number one on, my, on the list really because I wanted to talk a little bit about her early history, is that Mary Blair was born in October 21st, 1911 in Oklahoma. And then she sort of moved from Oklahoma to Texas and then to California in the 20s, really to sort of pursue her eventual career in art. Yeah, she would, she would go on to go to college at San Jose State College and graduate from there. But yeah, this was all prior to her meeting and then eventually marrying Lee Blair. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because that that talking about going to college is really number two on the list because mm-hmm. she her early years, she actually had a tie to Walt Disney even before she worked for him because she went to San Jose State and then got a scholarship shoot to the very renowned Chouinard Institute in Los Angeles, which is now the site of Cal Arts, which was obviously created by Walt and Roy, who helped merge the Conservatory of Music and the Chouinard Art Institute. So, you know, she's got this sort of connection to Walt, you know, Walt and his his sort of handprint very early on. Yeah, and it, it is, Cal Arts is one of these places that everyone knows the tie to Disney, everyone knows the ties to all the animators and the engineers and all the things that, that blended together and that that really became a, a Disney brand, almost as it were. And she get, and she's there just before that really, that transition takes place to get to get her feet in the door with that. Yeah, and obviously Cal Arts, and maybe we should do a show about Cal Arts one of these days oh, that'd be because fun. the list of people that have graduated from Cal Arts, I mean, is and we know some of the people, right? Ron Cohey right. would graduate, but Chuck Jones and Bob Mackey and Herb Ryman and so many other people that would eventually come to work for and have a significant impact on the Disney company. Yeah, that'd be a fun day. That we should, yeah, we should definitely get on that one of these we'll have days. To do a, we'll have to maybe bring some of the guys from Cal Arts. On the show to do it with us. There we go. Um, So the third one on the list is that Mary didn't always work for Disney. And in fact, she left the company not once, not like many, many times, but would eventually keep coming back because her first job in the animation industry wasn't for Disney, but was with MGM, with Metro Golden Mayor. Right. And she would and she would go on from, you know, on some of her sabbaticals, she would end up at Radio City Music Hall designing some of their stage sets for their holiday productions. And she had all these great things that she did well outside of Disney. Yeah. And she actually worked with her. She left MGM to work with her husband at the Ub Iwerks studio before eventually coming to Disney in 1940. And that's when things really sort of take off for her because she works on Dumbo and early versions of of Lady and the Tramp and this never released second version of Fantasia called Baby Ballet which obviously was released maybe what 20 uh, God, 1990 sounds like it's yesterday but it was I guess 20 almost 30 years 25 25 years years ago ago. right (laughs) yeah she did she did a lot of work on on that she she would do work on Song of the South, you all know, everyone tends to know her for the things like Peter Pan, Alice in Wonderland, Cinderella. But really, she had a lot of work that she did and, and a, you know, a big handprint on. And you can see it when you look at things like Lady and the Tramp, Song of the South, Dumbo. Yeah, and she actually left. You know, she wasn't with the studio long when she first started in 1940. She left for a while and then traveled with Walt and Lillian and other artists on that you know famous tour that he did of the South American countries, you know, because Walt wanted her, he loved her style of 
the, the watercolors. So that led to her as the art supervisor for Saludos Amigos and Three Caballeros. Right, and this is, you know, to get everyone in the background, this is that 1941, just, just prior to world, you know, our involvement in World War II, we're going out into the world. Um, and she was one of, it was only a 20 member crew that Walt took with him. And she got to go right to, to design these things. And it, it was, it was this look that she created with all these watercolors of the children, specifically in South America, that would be so pivotal later on down the road. Yeah. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the films that she worked on, but it's really interesting how, you know, she comes to work for the company again, and the 50s, obviously, very, very busy with Cinderella and Alice in Wonderland and Peter Pan. And so but then after Peter Pan is over, she leaves Disney again, and she goes freelance for a while and works for companies like Nabisco, Pepsodent, Maxwell House, other food companies, doing a lot of uh, advertising campaigns. And this is like another maybe did, little did you know, some kids might not even know what these are anymore, but she worked for <laughs> Simon & Schuster and did the little golden books, right. and some of which are still, you can still actually get some Mary Blair little golden books today. Yeah, if you if it, and you, even the ones who that aren't Mary Blair, you can see that the inspiration that she had on the little golden books and the book of verse that they put out and all these other things. And you know, there's there was a great book they put out. I think it was last year the about the art of the little golden books, and so much of that is is Mary Blair's work. And you know, she defined what it was to be a little golden book. Well, she had such. You know, such a unique style. Like, you know, if you're familiar with Disney art, you instantly recognize a, a Mary Blair piece of work. And I think that's why so many people love and collect. And we'll talk about how there's this sort of new resurgence of, of Mary Blair items, not just on canvas, but on, on other products as well. And I think that's why she kept coming back. You know, Walt off, oftentimes Walt would request for her to come back, right? Mm -hmm. Because he loved her sense of style and her use of color. And that's why he wanted her to work on, you know, t for example, Small World for the World's Fair. Right. And it's one of those moments where, you know, Walt knows what's going to drive someone, what motivates them. And, and knowing when he had a project that was uniquely, that was suited for Mary Blair, and he would, he would call her and say, hey, why don't you come back for, for, for this? And that is what led to, you know, Small World. And I think that sort of leads to the next thing is that she worked on more, forget, you know, small, she worked on more films and other projects and in other different capacities than you might have realized, right? So we talked about, obviously, uh, you know, Song of the South and Cinderella and Alice in Wonderland, again, that, that time in the 50s when things were really busy. But she also worked on, she worked in the animation department, in the art department, as a writer, like in so many different ways. So other than she worked on So Dear to My Heart, you know, doing some, some of the mm -hmm. cartoon art. Melody Time, which I love. Uh, How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. Make Mind Music. Health for the Americas. Cleanliness Brings Health. It was a documentary back in the 40s. We talked about the, the Caballeros and Saludos Amigos. She worked on The Wonderful World of Color uh, as a writer for a while and in a, once, a short called Once Upon a Time in Wintertime. Once Upon a Winter Time, say that five times fast, <laughs> as well as, you know, other documentaries and things like that. So she didn't just do, you know, static art. I mean, she was a writer and she was an animator. And again, you can sort of, once you start to know that, you can really start to see her influence on some of those films. Most certainly. I mean, you, know, you think about ju just, you know, in the background when she did stuff for, you know, like Ichabod at uh, Mr. Toad. You look at the you know, uh, Annie Blue Bonnet. You just you start to realize you look at this stuff, and whether she was actually doing the art herself or she was, you know, passing the, passing her knowledge on. And there are so many artists who learn so much from her. She she had she had her hand in so many pieces as Walt really Walt and the company itself learned more about her and learned to see all the pieces that she had to offer. Yeah, and you know what? And so much that she had to do had to do with color, right? When we talk about guys like John Hench and Herbie Ryman and the importance of color, and that was one of the things that that Mary did so well too. And I think, you know, we should sort of pause for a second and talk about, you know, Walt's influence on Mary Blair and and allowing her to do some of the things that she did, right? His sort of vision in, in technology and in, in of the world and, and, of, and of values really sort of came through in Mary Blair's art. And I think he really kind of, 
remember too that the timing of, of everything. This is a very male dominated studio, right? Right, and he gave her a lot of flexibility and leeway to try different things, to explore different colors and and characters that might not have been what was traditionally being pumped out by the studio. No, and you can and you see that in multiple things. And you see different art forms that she takes on even later on in her career. Maybe not necessarily from you know Walt, but because they were saying she's so great at these, let's guide her, let's nudge her in this direction. And suddenly she took it and did what would go miles above what they would even expect from her. Um, and you, you know you look at some of the concept art of things like it's a small world and. The colors that they ended up with were toned down compared to what she did, but her colors were so great. You know, she would put two different shades of red right next to each other, which was really a no-no in the art business. But she would do it, and it looked perfect. Yeah, and the interesting thing about what she did is, you know, if you look at some of Mary Blair's art, it, it's again very, um, it's very clearly defined as her work. But when she was doing some of the concept art for these things. You know, it wasn't like she was doing an accurate representation. It right. was sort of her interpretation. So, for example, you know, Peter Pan is my favorite movie. And the scene of Peter and the children flying around the clock tower or Captain Hook's ship against the night sky, it's not necessarily a scene that you would see in the movie, but definitely something that they took the color and the inspiration for. And then you look at that and then you look at the film and you're like, I, I get it. This is de- this definitely came right from Mary Blair, and I think Alice in Wonderland is another uh, really, really good example of the styling and the color influence she had. Yeah, I think Alice in Wonderland is where she had all the pieces at that point. I mean, she just she, they 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 just let her run rampant over that because it it really was kind of Mary Blair in Wonderland at that point. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're right with things like Peter Pan, with things like Cinderella. You know, she didn't have. As larger thumbprint, but you could see that use of color, that use of, of dimension, almost that that she really gave them a, a great place to start from. Yeah, and you wonder had she not left and continued to come back, and and Walt give her that freedom and sort of free reign to to be Mary Blair, right? Instead of saying this is how we do it here, this is what you need to conform to. You wonder how that might have sort of stifled her art and how different it might have been had he not done that. But I think that was a you know, I think that was typical of Walt. And look, it, like many of the people who work there, you might have started in the art department, and next thing you know, you're doing animation, you're doing writing, you're doing all these other things. I mean, look at how many different Imagineers were told, listen, yeah. I'm yanking you from this, and now all of a sudden you're going to start working on a theme park. And they're like, what's a theme park? And it's like, I don't know. We're right. going to figure it out ourselves. We're going to design it all ourselves. It's fine. It's going to be all of us. It's, we'll, it's all of us. We'll be together. It'll be all fine. Right, because you never said no to Walt, right? If Walt no. said this is what you're going to do, that's just what you did. Right. And he would put you together with someone who you may not get along with personally, but by God, your work together was going to be amazing. <laughs> True. So uh, here's a, another thing you should need to know. Um, and and I, I learned this as I was doing the research as well, because I, I love getting to know uh, about the person. Right. That's why I love doing interviews on the show, because you can read a lot about the things that they did. But I, I like to hear their stories. And I had read an article about the fact that despite being so ridiculously talented as an artist, she had horrible eyesight. And then from there, you start to learn some more about the, the personal life of Mary Blair. So back in 2010, there was a, a panel about Mary Blair uh, called the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences presents the Mark Davis Collection Celebration of Animation, Mary Blair's World of Color, a centennial tribute. That's the <laughs> that's the Say that five times fast. <laughs> but... You know, it was a program that also included a number of people that knew Mary, right, and that worked with Mary, people like Alice Davis and other artists in there. And, you know, another thing we should sort of refer to is this this Mark Davis celebration of animation, really to sort of um, help people craft their expertise. I think in the interview I did with Alice Davis years ago, she talked about how important that was to her. But they had a panel there with Alice Davis and uh, Mary Blair's niece, Maggie Richardson. So Mary Blair actually had, according to what they had talked about on the, the panel, and it was I, I wish I could have been there to see it because in reading about it uh, and having met Alice Davis, I could see her going, come on, tell the story about this. <laughs> and told the story about how 
she had horrible eyesight. So it was sort of noted in the company that she always had all these different glasses with her and sometimes <laughs> actually stack different glasses on her face because she had different designs and colors and strengths and things like that. So depending on what she was wearing and what she had to look at, that would determine sort of the, uh, the, the glasses that she would use. And she actually had a pair that would allow her to see through you could each you could flip up each lens independently so she could see through one while she was putting makeup on with the other <laughs> <laughs> yeah see you learn something new every day even i learn things every day like yeah when you were talking about that i was like this is incredible i was like makes me feel better about my eyesight that's for sure <laughs> So some of the things that I thought were, were just fun and really sort of humanizes the person that obviously we have never gotten a chance to, to meet. And I haven't even, right. you know, I've never really actually seen an interview with Mary Blair. But Mary liked to gamble a little bit and play the ponies. She was uh, she was a, a poker player. She loved horses, used to like taking her niece, um, Maggie Richardson, to the racetrack at Santa Anita. And one time she bought Maggie's sister a, a doll at the track, and the girl named and they named the doll Anita after her, after the racetrack, which you know I'm sure her parents <laughs> were really happy about. <laughs> well, I guess there were there were worse things to name it, name a doll after. So and and uh, in reading the article, you know Alice had sort of prompted her to say, "Come on, tell the story about Christmas, right?" So imagine at Christmas, Mary Blair is your aunt, and. You don't know if you're going to get a toy from her, which is probably what you want, or uh, another paint, you know, uh, great, another yeah. of Aunt Mary's paintings. But, you know, of course, now having one of those things, you know, an original Mary Blair is is priceless to many collectors. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, and, and she did, you know, there were so many different things. You know, we think of all the Disney artwork, but she would, she would, she would go out and do paintings of, you know, her, you know, her children and her family and all, you know, and, you know, random, you know, uh, people that she would meet and just all, you know, just really out in the world. And, you, you know, you start thinking about, right, there is another side to this artist. Yeah. And, you know, as I was reading about that story, I, I thought back to um, when I got to interview Alice Davis. I actually got to go to her home, right? And I was like freaking out because remember, I'm a fan first. So even if nobody listened to the show, I didn't care because I was going to Alice Davis's house. And you can actually listen to the interview back on show 193. That was back in uh, 2010. I can't believe it was five years ago. So here I am walking into this home in California. And I'm not sure if I talked about it on that show, but it, gosh, it was like walking into a Mark and Alice Davis museum, right? Because in one room, they had so many things. They they were they were avid travelers, right? So many things they collected from, you know, South America and New Guinea and all these like exotic places. And then you'd see cards that they would draw and send to each other. You know, in the bathroom was like Valentine's Day cards up on the wall, and there was just artwork everywhere. And you know, we got to go in Mark's studio, and I completely like totally nerded out. And we're getting ready. I'll never forget, Ryan, as we're getting ready to walk out the front door, just before she says, hey, you guys want to come and see Mark's studio? And my friend, was, Scott, was with me. I was like, yeah. She, I looked down, and I'll never forget, by the front door was this huge box. It was st stuff. She was moving stuff all around. And on the top of the box was an original Mary Blair, just, you know, oh, kind of laying just around. Just hanging out. <laughs> like, you know, and there was a bunch of them that, that Mary had created for Alice. And this one was this, oh, God, I can remember it was like the greens and the blues. I'm like, you, you want this? Like, if you're going to just, you know, throw it out, if it's going in the garage, uh, I'll take it. But I was like, yeah, you know, how many people's houses do you go into? And there's an original Mary Blair just, you know, just sitting in the foyer. <laughs> So, yeah, she, I mean, she did so many great things and it is that use of color that just, it pops and you, right. You recognize it immediately as that's Mary Blair. You know, I can remember seeing, and I can't remember where I've seen this, but you know, this artwork that she did when it was like these three elephants and one was pink and one was blue and one was yellowish orange and the way they were, you know, they were all just lined up together, but the way they stacked it, you know, it's yeah, she, she definitely had just one of a kind art talent. Yeah. And, and the, the use of, of, of color, uh, you talk about color conveying emotion and c color conveying a sense of, you know, good and evil. And, and like that's some of the thing. I mean, look, you could just go to Google and just do a search for Mary Blair art. And if you've never actually had a chance to look at it, um, it it's, it's very um, 
it, it's many of the things she did were very bright, but some of the darker things that she did, you know, there's a there's a couple of like Alice in Wonderland paintings where she meets the Cheshire cat and just a, a simple use of not a huge palette of colors. I, I think it's just wonderful the way she does it. Yeah, most certainly. And it, it, and it, it's that ability to know when to use the color, when not to use the color. I mean, her mastery of color was is is you know the cornerstone of a Mary Blair piece, but it is. It's that knowing of when and when not to use it. So uh, going next on our list and, and segueing nicely because the, the use of color, uh, I'm sure you already know that Mary Blair designed the 90-foot tall, 18,000 hand-painted tile mural in the contemporary, right? What is and will always be to me the Grand Canyon Concourse. She created that mural with, you know, again, that very Mary Blair style of, you know, birds and animals and flowers and Native American kids. And you sometimes, Ryan, don't realize just how massive. I mean, 18,000 tiles painted by hand. Um, you can see it as you, as you go through the monorail, but I, I mean, I think that you need to get off and get down Absolutely. onto the fourth floor and really kind of take your time and walk around it and like touch it. Like go to Contempo yeah. Cafe where you can actually reach up and touch it and, and look for the Mary Blair signature tile too. Yeah, there's so much in that. And you, even on the model, you'll miss an entire side because it's, it's on all four sides of this thing. You know, we talk about the number of tiles. It weighed, all those tiles together weigh 54 tons. <laughs> and you, you look at that, and it's just a giant, it, that had to be a giant jigsaw puzzle for somebody to figure out how to put together. And thank goodness we have this. Originally, you know, they, the architect was looking at making this giant, shiny, monolithic, post through the middle of the building and they saw the artwork and they said, no, this is, this is the direction we're going to go. We're going to take these little vignettes from around, uh, you know, the Grand Canyon and the, and the people. And there are, there are so many characters in there. There are so many wonderful little, little stories happening that you really need to take time to explore and find. And, you know, and I think everyone has their favorite, you know, character or favorite piece that's going on in there. Yeah. And one of the, the sections that I love is, the the young the the Native American girls and actually if you go to the Contempo Cafe that's where you can really see it up close and and touch it and understand the you know get sort of a, a tactile impression of them and, and because they they are sort of um, there is sort of a, a texture to them um, and that's yeah. one of the things that you know again I, I I I hope will always remain a signature element of the contemporary. I, yeah, it's been there for so long now. It is such a mark. Like it is what you remember of it. You know, aside from that, that you know, silhouette it cuts outside the building. Once you're inside, that is what you think of as a contemporary. So no matter what happens on the Grand Canyon Concourse with the restaurants and the shops, that I believe should always stay as part of that. I agree. I agree. Because some people say, well, you know, it doesn't really fit into this sort of modern. You know, when they're trying to keep it modern. A yeah. frame building, but uh, and it's like old beats new. It's fine. It's old right. beats new. <laughs> so uh, next on the things that that you should know and probably already do know is that she did not make a mistake accidentally <laughs> when she created the animals. And obviously, we're talking about uh, the 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 man, the myth, the legend, the five legged goat. Ah, oh, the five legged goat. It's gonna t- if you don't know where it is, it is going to take you a little bit of time to find it. But it's but that's the treasure hunt. That's what it, it's it's worth. But you're right. She intentionally designed it with a with the five legs, and that goes back to her principle of no piece of art should ever be considered perfect. And so, in order to to kind of dissuade from people thinking this is her masterpiece, this is a perfect piece, there's a five legged goat. Yeah, and it is sort of hard to find, right? It, it's it's you have yeah. to look on the side that sort of faces. The mono station all the way, just the, sort of the, the second mesa under the the top of the man, the the, um, the mountain. There's mm-hmm. a five legged goat, and just to the right of it is a normal traditional four legged. Four legged, <laughs> right? They're 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 a little blue in color. They're a little sad, um, but yeah, it's it's up there. You can find it. It's it, it it really is one of those pieces that you know everyone does go and look for because that is what the mural is known for at this point. And while it may be the biggest mural she ever did, it's not the only one she ever created for a Disney theme park. And in fact, the original mural, well, a different original mural actually exists, existed, slash, parentheses, whatever, air quotes, uh, in Disneyland. 
Right. In Tomorrowland, as you would come down that main thoroughfare, both sides of the concourse had these had this mural that would look down over you, and it was called the Spirit of Creative Energies Among Children. And you had these great, you know, these images of children and these, you know, communication satellites and all these pieces that were, you know, the future as told through her very distinctive tile work. Yeah, and if you look at those, which you can't see now, it would almost look as though you could pull it off and bring it into the Grand Canyon Concourse because it's nearly identical in terms of color and styling. Again, the story that's told there, because everything is all about story, right. is very different than the one that you would find at the Contemporary. Oh, most certainly, yeah. But but it, again, it's, it's that whole Mary Blair ties everything together, and it was, this, you know, the tile work was not necessarily something inherent to her. It was something that Disney kind of put in front of her and said, can you, you know, we want you to try to work with this. And she fell in love with the medium. Well, and that's the thing. You know, we said that the the tiles aren't just about color. They have texture to them, right? Yeah. And they're about story. So they give her an idea, uh, a very sort of abstract idea. And on one side, like sort of the, the north side mural has children from different nations dancing and making music together. Boy, that sounds a lot like another attraction that I know. Mm. And there's ribbons above their head. And those aren't meant to be clouds. Those are supposed to symbolize, you know, communication around the world. And there's satellites to sort of bring the entire world together. While the other side is about different types of, you know, water and solar and whatever. And and again, these are huge. You know, they're 50 plus feet in length, almost 16 feet high. Um, And while they still, you know, it's a shame that, that you can't see them anymore, right? Because while they definitely scream 60s, I, I think they, you know, they don't necessarily fit in with the, the current state of Tomorrowland, which is why they were unfortunately covered in 1986-ish when mm-hmm. Star Wars opened, right? 86, 87? Yep. Yeah, the, it, eighty, yeah, eighty six, and then you know one of the one of the new murals that got put up, I think, was changed again in nineteen ninety eight. Um, but according to to the other, you know, one of the other Disney legends, Marty Sklar, who we all know and love, both of those murals are were left behind, and they were just covered by these new facades. It would be really interesting, and I guess it probably wouldn't ever happen. But it would be really interesting if um, they were able to to somehow uncover that again, mm-hmm. um, just to sort of let people enjoy and appreciate them. And, and I, yeah, I think it would take you know in in my mind in a perfect world they'd be able to to remove them and you know because you have this flow there between it's a small world and Fantasyland and Tomorrowland where they all kind of meet you know meet at a cross section wouldn't it be great to kind of have that in that corridor area where you where they could still be seen they could still be loved and it kind of ties all those pieces together. Yeah, and you know the thing that's important about Mary Blair too, and I think we alluded to this earlier that her work wasn't just in and around and for Disney, right? She worked on, um, you know, she worked, like you said, for Hallmark. She did Mm -hmm. Nabisco and different food companies and lots of other advertising. So in the art world, um, she is very well known and very recognized and her legacy sort of transcends Disney. So what one, another thing you might not have ever known, I think this is nine, is that back in uh, October of 2011, to celebrate her 100th anniversary of her birth, they had a Google Doodle created mm-hmm. for her. Yeah that, yeah, that was one of the great ones. That's in, whether you knew it was coming or not, when you saw it, you, if you know anything about Mary Blair or you know anything about Disney, you recognize the style immediately. Yeah, it, it's obviously it was not a Mary Blair original. It was sort of the Google name, and we'll um, I'll right. put a link where you could just sort of you can probably still search for it. I think they still have the yeah, archive still of there, all the right. of all the Google Doodles up there as well. But I loved, and I think we as Disney fans, Ryan, love to see that. Right when 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 there's a name that we know that we're so familiar with from our love of Disney or Disney history, when it starts to sort of transcend the Disney bubble, and go out into yeah. you know regular pop culture. It, there's something sort of uh, comforting and validating and that makes you sort of happy to see other people getting to appreciate her work as well. 
Most certainly. And it, it, I think it's part of the reason we do what we do is, you know, yes, we're educating people. We're giving people who love Disney more knowledge, more tools. But, you know, what happens when that person does a Google search for Mary Blair? You know, some of this maybe get to, may get to them and may get to their ear and, and teach them something more that they didn't know about someone they loved. And it, it does. It's whether it's inside or outside the bubble. I think it is that, that sharing of those passions and the way it, it does transcend one thing or another uh, that, that, moves us forward and that in ke- that keeps it all so relevant you know one thing that's that it's like good and bad right is that you know mary blair she passed away in 1978 and mm-hmm. like so many of these people whose names we know who have contributed to the company they've become more famous right more mm-hmm. renowned after they passed away than when they were alive and i credit disney for doing that i credit you know, D23 and the, the Disney Legends, you know, organization and the right. Walt Disney Archives and the Destination Ds and the D23 Expos because they are humanizing yes. the, the, the things that we see in the parks, right? Other than Dorothy or Redman, nobody got to really sign their work inside <laughs> the theme park, right? You don't see this, this was designed by so and so. Artists don't get to sign their murals. So by right. Disney doing exhibits and having you know displays look if you go and i'm not sure if it's still there anymore but i know even the walt disney family museum had uh, a mary blair exhibit where you got to see mm. like what her desk looked like and and where she worked and some of the things that she worked on i love the fact that they do that and they are making us so much more aware of who they are and and how they did what they did and you know, I hate to sort, of, but hopefully inspiring other people to pick up the pen or the paintbrush or whatever it may be. Right. I mean, it, it, it is. It's keeping that history alive. It's keeping it relevant. It's you know, and you have these people with the internet and everything today. People can go and find this information on their own if they truly wanted to find out who made this attraction, who designed what they love. But with you know, with Disney's level of storytelling and with the vast amount of resources they have of their own history. That's where that's where the the golden key comes is they're showing you they're you know they're they're opening the door and saying no come in we want to tell you all of our you know all of these secrets from all the people that we've loved and who have loved us over the years yeah so obviously this is definitely something that you did know but may not know when is that she was named a Disney legend but back in 1991 and look judging by the list of people that were inducted I, you know they must have really been desperate for names because it's only people like Ken Anderson <laughs> Julie Andrews Carl Barks Mary Blair Cod Clotes <laughs> Don DeGrotti Sterling Holloway Fess Parker and Bill Walsh, Walsh. Uh, you know that is not a, 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 a bad class to be in no no there's not a throwaway <laughs> name on that list anywhere yeah, and, and you know that's that's what I love about um, the Disney Legends, and I love the fact now that you can go to D twenty three Expo yeah. every other year and and see the Legend Ceremony, right? Or you can go to the Disney Studios and see where these legends have their handprints. And look, I mean, it's simple to look online, but if you go back and look at some of the names on the Disney Legends list, I think you'd be amazed at who these people are. And I would encourage you to, you know, maybe you don't know who a uh, Wooly Reitherman is. Like, click on it and start to dig a little deeper. Not to quote Mama Odie, but dig a little <laughs> deeper and really start to see the influence they had on so many different things that we get to enjoy. Yeah, and we're in this great period now where so many of the things that so many of the legends who who came before are inspiring the legends we have the legends we have now and what that's going to be down the line it's just it's incredible but it is there's something about seeing it touching it being a part of it that is just incredible yeah and so look obviously we 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 tried to talk about in a fun way 10 things you might not have known but really when you hear mary blair you know the the thing that should come to mind hopefully is it's a small world Mm -hmm. and Knowing what you know and seeing her work, and, and I would almost encourage you to just Google and look at some of her, look at the wide spectrum, intentional yeah. pun, of art that she created, and then go look at either or both of the small worlds, Disneyland and Walt Disney World, mm-hmm. because you can see that her sense of color and style is 
you know, uh, it just bleeds all over the, you know, all throughout the attraction. And once you start to see that, you can understand that this is sort of a, a you know, it's a tribute almost to Mary Blair. Most certainly. And it, it, it does, it, you know, it transcends borders, it transcends colors. It, it's just this great, you know, it, it still pays respect to, to her original vision. It, it still is so much of her and to keep it alive and vibrant is just incredible. And I think when you go through, um, you know, I, I try and sometimes go through attractions with a different eye, right? Often it was the first time we go, we're looking around and we're listening into things, we're trying to see things. I would almost encourage you to ride It's a Small World a few times, but take, pay closer attention not to the structures and the right. kids and the, the music, but pay attention to the use of color, how it's meant to evoke different emotions, how, you know, look at the... the oranges and the purples and, and, and how they sort of represent some of the hotter areas, right? And sort of the, the hotter right. regions of Small World and some of the other, you know, the blues and the greens give you a sense of a, a cooler, more tropical sense. I mean, I know I'm sort of overstating the obvious, but as I was going through not long ago, I, I was sort of thinking about that and it really kind of struck me because it changes your perception a little bit of you know, perspective and dimension and what those, uh, what those areas are trying to convey. Yeah, it definitely does. And it, it's more about, you know, looking at the whole picture and seeing what you, what, what all is there and get, and then getting into those, lo getting lost in the little, the little moments that, that where you see that juxtaposition of not just necessarily the characters, but of how they, how they, are with their world, you know, how they interact with the world around them and the animals and the colors that were chosen specifically for them because of you know, their friendly nature or, or because of their fur being warmer. And it's, it's all there if you're just giving it that, that a, a different eye. Yeah. And, and it's funny how sometimes these, these, um, these colors that almost wouldn't, and look, I, I'm not an artist, so you know it's hard for me to sort of articulate what, what I feel, but sometimes colors that almost look as though they shouldn't go together you know, right. just work so well, and it gives you a sense of theme even more so than the architecture that you see. So I'm thinking specifically when you go into the, the Mexico and South American areas, mm -hmm. how those uses of the yellows and the oranges and sort of the, the burnt rust give you that kind of feel. And then you can go to, you know, when you go through the, the UK and Paris, it's bright reds and bright blues, and it has a very different, you know, a feeling to it. Right, you get, you know you move more less away from the national you know symbols of pride, the national colors to the actual real world color, you know the actual real world tinges to the to what you're seeing. Where you know it is, it's the the sandy beaches and those browns and those rusts like you were talking about, or you know you you have those blue and green waves when you're in the Polynesia area. It's it's all of these pieces that you know and it it does. It's sometimes it's it's looking very closely at what colors symbolize that nation and sometimes it's very clearly looking at what colors make up the landscape. Yeah, and you know if you look at things like the facade, you know, it almost looks somewhat abstract a little bit, but if you look at some of those original designs for the facade, it's the use of colors that that sort of give those things shape and and meaning and, and reference points i think definitely and, and and even so far as to go where she didn't give color where she left holes and things where you know there are cutouts or where there's a just a white space why is that there and what is that what is that telling you about the story she's telling you and so i think the last thing that you need to know right we all look for hidden mickeys and hidden pascals and maybe a hidden jafar here and there but there's actually a hidden Mary Blair inside Disneyland. Mm -hmm. So if you go into the you know Western European scene uh, and look at the Eiffel Tower, there's a little blonde doll uh, holding a balloon who, who was actually created as a direct tribute to the you know the, the designer of the attraction, Mary Blair. Right. They, yeah. They, they. It's her world, so she most certainly belongs in it. <laughs> It's her world. You're just living in it. So you're just <laughs> passing through it. But yeah, you have to sort of turn around in order to see her. So you, you have to sort of make a, a deliberate effort. It's, yeah, to, you have to, to yeah, you have to make that, that 
deliberate, like it's a deliberate effort to actually find it and look for her. So yeah, and but she's, thing, she's due the respect. She's due the look. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you the the one thing that I, I really like seeing. Right, we we're, we're nostalgics. We love everything that that's old, that's new again. I, I love Ryan seeing all of the Mary Blair inspired merchandise that right. is coming out or has been coming out. And it's everything from T-shirts to coasters to pocketbooks to, you know, little golden books and pieces of artwork and and Ah. dolls, whatever it is, you know. And this is why I like doing segments like this, because when you see that, you're like, oh, I love that Mary Blair look. I I want you sort of I want you to know more about who the person is, who the person Mm -hmm. was that created it. Definitely. And you can you can see that this reverence for for her and for her work and it's a small world in particular is coming back around one with the artwork but two you know, I can remember days where that ride was a walk on and you could go on it and you could just sit on your boat all day if you so chose because you really <laughs> love that earworm um, but now there are there are massive lines they're backed up because people are realizing what it's worth again and they're going and they're in droves to see it yeah and and, and I again I love the um, the the fact that Disney is, is taking that and repurposing it. Yeah. on so many different things. So you can take a little piece of that home. And, and I dig, you know, look, it, it's, it screams 60s, right? But that's, mm-hmm. you know, sort of what I love, that sort of retro feel that it has to it. Yeah, I think if my, my house gets any more retro, <laughs> though, I'm going to be in a little bit of trouble. You've got but a patient you're right. wife. You've got a patient I do, wife. I do have the, uh, you know, the vase that, that Kevin and Jody did a couple of years ago of the Grand Canyon Concourse piece. And it's, it's just so wonderful to see. And it's not just, you know, okay, so this is our anniversary, so we're going to do this. It has, it has legs again. And it is, you know, there's new pieces coming out all the time. Yeah, and there's stuff, you know, there's personal stuff. There's stuff for the home. I mean, I saw somebody right. with a, um, uh, like a small world iPhone case, you know. Mm-hmm. So you can do that. You can get you know, uh, artwork as well. I mean, Art of Disney has a ton of Mary Blair inspired things. And, and I know a recent shirt that I saw was directly inspired uh, by the, the Small World facade. Yeah, I, I could say, it with the, like, some of her concept art from the Small World and some of those pieces, I've actually seen people now decorating their house. You know, they, they've gotten that image and they are projecting it and then they're painting it onto their walls. So th- that is a, a wall in their house is, is this Small World facade. So uh, listen, I, those are those crafty Etsy Pinterest people. I can't do <laughs> I can't. Do, I can buy it, but I can't. Yeah, I can't I have, actually. Right, recreate. right. I have a bookshelf and the artwork goes on the bookshelf. <laughs> and that's about as far as I, ha- I can get right now. So uh, do you have sort of a favorite Mary Blair piece, whether it's a piece of art or influence on a film, or is it Small World, or is it the mural? It's There's two pieces that when I think of Mary Blair, these are the pieces that I think of, and it's, um, well, it's anything Peter Pan. That's all the artwork she did for Peter Pan. There's so many pieces from it, you know, whether it's that map of Nether, Neverland or, uh, you know, Peter staring out over the lagoon. Like, those are the pieces that, that resonate with me, but... Um, which I love when they did the children's book of it a few years back because it's just so much of that art that I love. Um, like you, Peter Pan's one of my favorites of all time, and is, I am the boy who never grew up. Um, so that's the one piece. And the other piece is from the Grand Canyon Concourse, and it's the bear with the Native American headband, and he's standing up on you know, two feet. I don't know why that bear for so long has, has spoke to me, but that's the figure I go look for <laughs> when, I go, uh, when I go into the, into the Grand Canyon Concourse to look for the mural. Yeah, there's um, you know, there's a part of me that that little boy that fell in love with Disney World, uh, back when he was three and four, and staying at the Contemporary with his parents and riding the monorail for hours and hours and hours. There's something about the concourse, and there's something about that mural that, on a very personal level, strikes me because it evokes uh, a very strong personal emotional connection I have to why I love Disney the, the way I do. Um, I'm with you in terms of the Peter Pan. I, I love the image of the ship in the clouds and, and Peter and, and the, mm-hmm. the, the, the children flying around Big Ben. Mm-hmm. I, I really came to love some of the Alice in Wonderland artwork. But I will tell you, as I was researching this, I, I came across a piece that really struck me. And it, it's somewhat uh, obscure, but there's a, a, a concept piece that she drew for Susie, the little blue coop. 
Mm -hmm. And I don't know what it is, man. There's something about that car that when you first look at it, if you didn't know the story, it looks just like a little, you know, blue, blue, you know, coupe. Little blue coupe. Right. But if you look closely and you look at the 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 grill and there's that there's something so subtle about this simple line drawing of her smile and then you realize that the windshield are her closed eyes you know she was cars before they were cars right and I, there's something I, I I sort of and the the way that the the gentleman in the hat was just sort of staring at it there was something very simple about it that that I really came to like and and I think that's the whole point right the more you know the more you dig the more you explore the more yeah. you might actually enjoy and appreciate and maybe sort of fall in love with a little bit yeah and, and I always find new things you know I, autumn's my favorite season and and I just recently found the piece where she did with you know for uh you know Ichabod and the Headless Horseman it's the silhouette of the Headless Horseman all in black and you have the purple and pink kind of New England, you know, right at sunset kind of stuff going on. And, and I follow that. There's so much to fall in love with or to rediscover that, that there's always, yeah, there's always something new to love there. Yeah. And so I want to ask you, the listener, uh, do you have any sort of Mary Blair merchandise that you love? Is there a Mary Blair, Blair piece or attraction or mural or watercolor or whatever it is? that you specifically love, I'd love for you to leave a comment in the show notes. Go to www.radio.com, click on the podcast link, click on this week's episode, leave a comment there. We'll definitely look at the comments and respond there. You can also tweet me at Lou Mangello and tell me what your favorite Mary Blair item or piece of art or uh, influence may be. And of course, you know that I also want you to go and ride It's a Small World again with a little bit of a different eye and tell me uh, how, if at all, you, you looked at it differently. And then, only then, please go to MainStreetGazette.com, MainStGazette.com, to enjoy all the wonder and the pageantry that is Ryan Wilson. We do love our pageantry. <laughs> But we will uh, do this again. We have a, a couple of other Disney legends that we had talked mm -hmm. uh, about, thinking about. But if you, listener, have a Disney legend that you would love for us to, to cover, again, tweet me at Lou Mangello. He's at Main ST Gazette. Let us know uh, over on Twitter or on Facebook.com slash WDW Radio what other Disney legend or legends you'd like us to feature in the future. And Ryan Wilson, you know, we'll be going way back again and again on the show very, very soon. Always. I tried to, th I have no Mary Blair quote to end this with. No, I, 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 think, I think I could go the It's a Small World song route, I think, but I don't want to sing that. I was like, come on, think, yeah. do it for your fans. No. Just a little bit. What fa I have no fans of my you, singing. Oh, there are, listen. There are no fans of my singing. I, listen, there's many, many fans. There's many fans. <laughs> Ryan Wilson on Spotify, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. yeah. No. No. <laughs> It's time for our Walt Disney World Trivia Question of the Week. We we'll invite you to test your knowledge of Walt Disney World history or see how well you pay attention to the details in what you see and sometimes in what you hear. If you think you got the answer right, you can then enter for a chance to win a Disney prize package. Before we get to this week's question, let's go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So last week we were talking about the D23 Expo and how once again Disney is going to present the Disney Legends Ceremony live in front of the audience that's there. And while this new class of Disney Legends includes names like Danny Elfman and Ivan Earl and George Lucas and Susan Lucci, your question last week was to simply tell me who was the very first Disney Legend. And once again, you guys never fail to disappoint because hundreds of you entered and got this one correct and you were either a huge fan of the Shaggy Dog or the Absent-Minded Professor or maybe even the Happiest Millionaire because you knew that Fred McMurray was the very first Disney legend who was honored with that in 1987. And last week's winner, randomly selected from all of the correct entries, is Russ Coyne. So Russ, congratulations. You were playing for all seven of the audio walking tours, the 102 Ways book, 
and a WWE Radio Magic Band cover. But if you played last week and didn't win, that's okay, because here's your next chance to enter in this week's Walt Disney World Non-Trivia Challenge. So this week, I'm going to do something a little bit different just to kind of mix things up because I was thinking about the merchandise as we were talking about Mary Blair and some of the things that we choose to purchase and save and collect and eventually really cherish and have an emotional connection to from the parks. And for some, it could be their first pair of Mickey ears, a plush, a map, a piece of jewelry, a shirt, or maybe just something that reminds you of a specific attraction. And that gave me the idea for this week's challenge. Because this week, I want you to show and share with me one of those things. And I don't mean physically share it, but in pictures. So we're going to try something new. I want you to take a photo of your favorite souvenir from Walt Disney World. And it could be something that you just bought on your last trip, or maybe something from your childhood or on your very first visit. Take a picture of it and share it with me. It can be of the item, or better at you and the item itself. It could be a selfie or have somebody take a picture of you and your favorite souvenir. And here's how to enter. All you need to do is simply share the photo on Twitter or Instagram, and you need to mention or tag me at Lou Mangiello and use the hashtag WDW Radio. Now, if you're not on Twitter or Instagram, you can also enter on Facebook by posting the picture to the WDW Radio Facebook page at facebook.com slash WDW Radio and indicate in the comments that it is for the August 9th souvenir contest. No purchase necessary, void where prohibited, etc., etc. And because I'm leaving for D23 in like a matter of hours, I'm going to give you two weeks to enter. So you have until Sunday, August 23rd to enter via Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. One entry per person, please. And then I'll choose one winner from all of the pictures posted on Instagram, Twitter, and or Facebook based on originality and creativity. And you are going to win not just all seven of the virtual audio tours and the 102 Ways book and a WW Radio Magic Band cover, but I'll also send you either a WDW Radio custom iPhone case if you have an iPhone 5 or 6, or... I'll send you a WW Radio luggage tag and stickers as well. But I really just want you to share something that you cherish and that you love. And more so than anything else, have fun. That's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in this and every week. I understand that your time is your most valuable commodity, and I sincerely appreciate you choosing to share and spend some of it with me. Also, I want to say a quick and big, huge thanks to some new members of the WW Radio Nation family, including Michael Lukeman, Laureen Charles, Luke Lawson, and Marla Chan. I sincerely appreciate your love and your friendship and your support. And if you want to help the show and receive exclusive rewards like monthly scavenger hunts, access to our private Facebook group, custom personalized magic band covers, logo gear, backpacks, t-shirts, care packages from Walt Disney World, live video group calls, and lots more, visit www.radio.com slash support. Again, it is completely optional, but a great way for you to help show your support for the show. And also don't forget that a portion of the proceeds is going to go to our Dream Team project to benefit the Make-A-Wish Foundation of America. Also, be sure and join me every Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern for WDW Radio Live. That's a weekly video call where you can log in and chat, ask and answer questions, and be part of the conversation. Ask me anything. Also, visit the site at www.radio.com for our blog, video, newsletters, free mobile app, and lots, lots more. If you have a question you want me to answer on the show, you can email me, lou at wwradio.com, or call the voicemail. I'll be heard on the air at 407-900-9391. I'd also love to connect with you online. I am at Lou Mangiello on Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, facebook.com slash Lou Mangiello. You can follow my personal profile there. But of course you know that nothing to me beats a handshake and a hug. That's why I have monthly meetups in Walt Disney World, on-the-road events as well. The next meet is going to be our day at the Disney Water Park. That's going to be Sunday, August 30th. You can visit the events page for more information. Also, don't forget, this week, uh, I'll be out at Disneyland. So we're going to have a meetup on the road 
at the Cozy Cone Motel on Thursday, right before D23 starts. And if you're going to be at Disney's D23 Expo, please come by our booth in Hall B in the Emporium. I'm going to be live broadcasting all three days. Come by, say hi. We'll have giveaways. You can be part of the show. And if you can't get there in person, again, visit D23ExpoLive.com. You can watch and be part of the fun all three days, not just from the booth, but we'll take the camera around, walk around, we'll do interviews, we'll sit in on some things. It's going to be a lot of fun, great way for you to be part of the conversation. Again, D23 Expo Live, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, August 14th through the 16th. And again, if you visit the events page, you can find out about upcoming events and meetups and including things on the road. I'm doing a lot of speaking to businesses and at conferences and schools. And like I did just a couple of weeks ago at Podcast Movement, I'm going to be doing that again on the road as well. And if I can help you somehow by coming to speak at your conference or to your business or to your kid's school, you can visit lumangelo.com for more information. And if you're looking to build your brand or build your business or turn your passion into your profession or help you launch or grow a podcast, click on the work with me tab on lumangelo.com and see how I can help you through some small mentoring and group coaching or even one-on-one. Again, it's lumangelo.com. A quick thanks to my partners and sponsors, Mouse Fan Travel, super psyched to be combining our booths and resources again this year at D23 Expo. They can help you get from here, wherever here may be, to anywhere, whether it's world, land, cruise, Aulani, ABD, whatever it may be, all at no cost to you. You can visit Becky and her team of agents at mousefantravel.com and go to celebrationspress.com because they will deliver to you in print or digital form Celebrations Magazine every other month. And as always, my friends, and you are my friends and you continue to show that if you like the show, All I ask is that you please help spread the word. Let others know about it. Tweet out that you're listening. Share links and comment over on Facebook.com slash Radio. And also, please rate and review the show in iTunes. It's a great way to help the show, help other people find the show as well. Thanks to you, we have more than a thousand five-star reviews. Please keep them coming. I want to quickly thank some recent reviewers like Andrew FZ, D Fielder, Forever Lolo, Marks BK18, Dave Flood, an Outlaw Torn 6, all the way from the United Kingdom. You can search for WW Radio in iTunes or visit www.radio.com slash iTunes for a direct link and instructions on how to rate and review the show. And finally, and most importantly, my sincerest thanks to you for taking the time to listen and email and tweet and everything else that you do that allows me to share my passion for Disney with you each and every week. It has been the most amazing circuitous adventure and journey and thank you for being part of it with me and I want you to do the same so although sometimes we think we know exactly where we're going and and what's going to happen and where we're supposed to be be open to whatever might come next because you never know where it may lead to you and sometimes it is an amazing remarkable wonderful happy place and I hope wherever that place is for you that you get there. Have an amazing, amazing week this week. Hope to see you in person or in the box at D23 next week. So until next time, see ya. Hey, Lou, my name is Sydney. I just wanted to first off say thank you for having an awesome show. I absolutely love listening to it. It helps me think of Disney when I'm not there and get all my Disney facts. I'm coming to Disney World in October, and I have a couple of questions. First off, um, I'm going to Tony's Town Square, and I just listened to your podcast about the live review there. So my question is, should I do the spaghetti or the chicken parmesan? And my next question is, I'm going to Spice Road Table for the very first time, and I am so excited. And what is your recommendation for that? Uh, Thanks so much, Lou, for all that you do. Have a great day. I am Dave Tarnoff from Johnson City, Tennessee, Grumpy Day on the uh, forums, and I'm calling with gratitude, a resentment, and also a suggestion that gratitude is, is that I don't think any human being should be allowed to visit Disney five times in one year, at least somebody from Tennessee, and I'm really grateful to have had that opportunity this this year. Um, the resentment is, is I've been to Disney, Disney World. Well, okay, one of those times was Disneyland Paris. 
that's really <laughs> beyond expectations. But the four other times were in Disney World, and Lou has managed to avoid me every one of those times. No meetups in the park. Well, oh well, have to give you a virtual hug then. Anyway, the suggestion is, as I was thinking, as I'm standing now in Epcot, that uh, a top ten with Tim might be, and, and please understand, this is sort of tongue-in-cheek, but how about a top ten bathrooms at Disney World? You could make up your own rules. Maybe the rules might be best decorated, best quiet, you know, quietest, uh, any number of things. So anyway, uh, enjoy the show a great deal, and thank you very much. Talk to you later. Bye. You've got a friend in me. Yeah. I know that you know the song, but I'm going to play it to begin with, just the way we wrote it, just for a change, you know. Think, what you think of what's going on in the world today, and how people are mistreating each other, and terrible things are happening, it's a good thing to think about the fact that it's a small world, let's not kill each other, you know? It's a world of laughter, a world of tears. It's a world of hopes and a world of fears. There's so much that we share that it's time we're aware. It's a small world. After all, there is just one moon and one golden sun. And a smile means friendship to everyone. Though the mountains divide and the oceans are wide, it's a small world after all. It's a small world after all. It's a small world after all. Come on, sing. It's a small world after all. It's a small, small world.